Classes in Wargame Design, a series of lectures based on George Philly's book, Designing Board Wargames, Introduction, to be available from Smashwords.com and Amazon Kindle. And today, Lecture 11, Maps, Gridding, Other Rules Topics. Today we're going to continue with our discussion of maps. And after we've discussed maps for a while, we will advance to discuss um, other issues in game design, other sorts of rules. I will briefly discuss, since a number of you did, the homework on the Stalingrad alternative supply and the notion that you would only be in supply if you were in a few squares or ten squares or whatever from a rail line and the rail line led back to one of your supply cities or the edge of the board for the Russians. And the core issue there, which sort of people sort of saw, except you haven't played the game, is that if you can only go two or five squares from a, a railroad supply line, uh, you're very limited in what sort of penetration you can do except along the rail lines. You become tied to the rail lines and broad flanking moves that go through open space stop working because your units run out of supply and after a turn or two they cease to exist. Now if you make the supply lines long enough this is not such a big deal but if the supply lines are very short like two squares there are issues. If they get up to say ten squares the matter is much less problematic. So that, that's the comment on the Stalingrad thing, and as you, if you have not played the game as much, it's a little less obvious. Okay, let us consider rules. And a fundamental issue in rules, which um, we somewhat discussed last time, is the notion that we are going to take the map and we are going to grid it. We are going to break it into squares or hexagons or triangles or God knows what. The point of gridding is that once you've gridded it, assuming you have a well laid out map and you have reasonable sized pieces, you can always tell exactly where each unit is and if you are doing movement, the movement becomes quantized, that is you go one space, two spaces, three spaces. And all of the arguments about did we move six inches or 6.1 inches or 5.9 inches, all of those arguments go away. Um, so that's an important positive feature of using gridded maps. The, however, there's a problem with gridded maps, and the problem with gridded maps is that the gridding distorts the distances you can move. So if you are on a rectangular map, and you start here, this move carries you 41% farther than that move. As I pointed out, there are ways of solving that by changing the counting rules. For example, if you call this move 2 and that move 3, and for a lot of moves, you pay extra movement points through rough terrain anyhow. So this isn't a bizarre complication. Suddenly, if we do this, the distortion goes down to 9%. Now, you can also do hexagons. Uh, the issue with hexagons is that hexagons also distort. They don't distort as much, but they still distort some, like 14% or so. And I noted, and it's a homework problem to write a rule that makes this work, that um, you can beat the hexagon distortion down a great deal by introducing a different counting rule. And roughly speaking, if your counting rule is, if you're wiggling back and forth, it costs five. If you're going in what is superficially a straight line, it costs six. If you write that rule right, you can beat the distortion due to the hexagon gridding down to a substantial distance. Um, hexagons and squares are by no means the only geometric patterns you can use. Uh, one choice, which we talked about briefly is to say we will use equilateral triangles. 
So here are equilateral triangles. I cannot offhand name a game that uses them. Now those shapes are a little inconvenient unless the unit counters are really teeny tiny. But one choice is to say we will make a big unit counter and the big unit counter will fit on two triangles. And you can analyze exactly what the implications of it fits on two triangles are. But there are several ways of handling that. You can, however, do something else which is somewhat different, which is to say, gee, we have been putting the units on the spaces, like chess or checkers. But you could also copy what is done in the Japanese game of Go. In Go, the Go stones are placed on the eyes, the intersections. And the intersections, the places where the lines cross, the vertices have a grid. The vertices have a grid just as the squares have a grid. The two vert types, the, the arrangement of the squares or spaces and the vertices are what are called duals. Uh, for go, the statement, we place the stones on the intersections rather than on the squares, has no consequences because, well, almost no consequences, the uh, lattice formed by all of the intersections is a square lattice. It's exactly the same as the lattice formed by the squares. And so it's simply a matter of custom which you use. Notice, however, this is called the picket fence paradox in old style programming. There are one, two, three, four intersections here, but there are only one, two, three spaces. And therefore, if you want to have a grid in which you play on the spaces instead of a grid on which you play on the vertices, you have to change the size of the grid slightly. For hexagons, matters are quite different. The vertices of a hexagon, each vertex is next to exactly three neighbors. And that's very different than the hexagons, each of which is itself next to six neighbors. Um, now you might say, have we heard something with three neighbors? Yeah, if you look at this, here's a triangle, and it has one, two, three neighbors. So the lattice formed by these equilateral triangles and the lattice formed by the hexagon vertices are actually the same. They may not look like each other, but they're actu they actually have all of the same connectedness, assuming you can only move from triangle to triangle across an edge. I discussed last time, I, and I remind you very briefly, we discussed the option of octagons. And an octagon basically has a, is a square with a little piece chopped out at each corner. There has been at least one game that used octagons. There have been several games that replaced the square intersections with little marks to remind players that they were not allowed to move diagonally. And you have two choices, diagonally moved are either allowed or not. Now there is an interesting feature of the hexagon grid which um, may not be instantly obvious. And the interesting feature is here is a hexagon. Let us count out some number of hexagons along each of the six axes. And if I've counted out, say, three hexagons in each direction, there's a hexagon here, 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 and here. These six hexagons form a hexagon themselves. It's a big hexagon. And you can imagine having a small hexagon grid which is broken up into big hexagons, just as you could imagine a small square grid which is broken up into big squares. There are several rules uses for these big squares or mega hexes. For example, if you were doing some sort of a limited intelligence rule, you might say that 
the opposition gets information from behind your lines in which it, on how many forces you have in each big square, but not exactly where they are. Or you could say if the opposition gets to know what sort of forces are in each mega hex, but not exactly where they're placed. Another use for mega hexes, this came from a World War I game, but you could use it for a World War II game, is to say, we have tactical aircraft assigned to an area. The area over which the tactical aircraft act is actually fairly limited, even much more so in World War I than in World War II. And therefore, well, the land units will sit in the squares, just as in Stalingrad. The air units are assigned to a mega hex. And they have air bases someplace in the mega hex. They may act in the mega hex. And if you want them to act in a different mega hex, you have to shift them to a different air base. And so you've had several different sorts of rules like this that take advantage of terrain features of different sizes. Now, you might think at this point we've sort of exhausted the ways you can tile a plane. In fact, I've just gotten started. An interesting possibility for tiling the plane is formed by pentagons. Now, a reasonable person is going to say, that's impossible. The angles of a pentagon are such that you cannot simply cover a grid with pentagons the way you can cover it with hexagons. They won't fit. And that is only true if the pentagons are regular. However, there's a picture in the book. Suppose we make the pentagons look vaguely like this. And there will be places where four of these things come together. And there will be places like this where three of them come together. And it turns out that if you accept the use of irregular pentagons, you can tile the board in pentagons. Indeed, one of the homework assignments is to take a pentagonal tiling, redraw a chunk of the Stalingrad map using pentagons rather than hexagons, and try playing out how the, rule, how the combat proceeds if you have pentagons rather than hexagons as the lattice. And you, presumably you will discover something, and what you have to do is report on what you found. There are at least... 14 known pentagonal tilings, where you just have pentagons of somewhat funny shape, and they lie together. And if you look at this one, each pentagon has five neighbors across its faces, and it turns out two neighbors across vertices. So you can do pentagonal tilings. There is an amusing tiling known as the dragon. The dragon tiling looks like an explosion in the edge manufacturing factory <coughs> in that it looks like if you have a picture of a tree in fall and there are the yellow leaves outlined against the blue sky, all of the yellow leaves matched, merged together are a shape. And you say, okay, it's, well, that's silly. But it turns out there are things that look like this that fit together and cover the entire map. The dragon tiling has the interesting feature that each dragon, when you find it, you can look it up on the internet, each dragon has six neighbors that it's covering over an extended area and one neighbor that it appears to touch at a vertex. So that you could say either that, gee, it's a funny way, weird way to draw hexagons, a really weird way to draw hexagons, and, or you could say, uh, it's, septahedra, it's a septagon covering because each dragon has seven nearest neighbors, as far as I can tell. Um, I did not, however, you will have to look and see if you can find any large dragon tilings. I only found small ones. But the answer is there are very complicated irregular shapes that will cover a map. Pentagons appear to be the most amusing regular shapes. Um, there is something called a Penrose tiling. And the Penrose tiling uses two shapes. 
which I am not drawing very well. And the feature of the Penrose tiling is it has orientational order. That is, all of the edges are parallel to one of ten directions. Maybe you should say five. Count, this is one or two. Should make your choice. The Penrose tiling is, has complete orientational order. But it has no spatial order. There's no repeat to the lattice. The hex, the square just repeats one, 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 one. This thing, while it looks irregular, if you look at it for a bit, you'll realize it's repeating. It repeats, it repeats, it repeats. The Penrose tiling has no repeat. Uh, the one difficulty with the Penrose tiling is that the English mathematician who invented it, Penrose, carefully patented all of the game applications. And therefore, if you wanted to make a game using it, you would run into an issue with his patent. And you would have to negotiate, and you, life would become educational. You'd learn about intellectual property rights, if you didn't already know about them. Um, however, there are variations on the Penrose tiling that have some of the same features, and that are also pretty to look at. Okay, let us consider complete alternatives to grids. After all, what is the point of a grid? We would like to say where the combat unit is. And the simplest alternative to saying you stick it in the space is you stick it on the lattice points. Well, the lattice is sort of an aside. The core issue is you have points. And you could imagine, we will go through Massachusetts, and we will do a road map type thing in which each of the 350 towns of Massachusetts is assigned a point. And the lattice will be quite irregular. And connecting the lattice points will be roads. Except in some cases, you can't go from place to place. You have to go around, for example, the Quinsigamond Reservoir is in the way. And so you have this irregular, these points, and they are connected by allowed lines. And the points indicate where you are allowed to go. Um, the game that you are probably familiar with that uses points is Chinese checkers. The traditional Chinese checkers, which as far as I know is really an American game, as far as I, I may be wrong on that, I never looked, I looked a bit. Um, has these little holes. You put marbles in the holes. You move the marbles from hole to hole, and you're allowed to jump and various other things. <clears throat> but in the end, um, the marbles sit in the holes. Um, having said the marbles sit in the holes, that's a point-to-point -point movement. Now, why might you want point-to-point -point movement in a game as opposed to area-to-area? -area? Why would that? And the answer is it might be a useful piece of chrome. <coughs> if you go back to the 18th century, army move, armies moved along roads, and roads of the period, I mean, people will think, oh, they must have been tiny. No, roads of the period were, were not paved, but they were extremely wide for the most part. The reason they turned into being wide is people driving carts would notice there were potholes or ruts, and so they would drive off to one side or the other. And so the ro roads were wide enough to be wide relative to modern roads, for the most part. They were wide enough so that if you were a French army unit marching down the highway, before the introduction of marching in time or marching in step, the uh, unit marching would be ten men wide, and there would be two yards between each man. So we are talking um, 20 yards, 60 feet wide. Of course, every so often you would come to a bridge. The bridges were not 60 feet wide. The bridges were barely wide enough to allow a wagon of standard size to get across. And so you would be marching up towards the bridge, which would be fairly narrow, and suddenly the men would have to collapse and run very fast across the bridge and then form up on the far side and continue to march. And so marching through a bridge 
or a hole in the hedge became quite inconvenient. The reason I'm describing this, though, is these armies traveled on baked bread. Baked bread without preservatives only lasts four days. So every three days, you had to stop. The um, cooks had to construct their um, furnaces, their cooking ovens, out of the, the bricks and stones you were hauling to construct them. You then had to sit a day while you made all of the bread you needed out of the wheat you were hauling, and you advanced. In addition, since you had to haul all the forage for the animals, um, <clears throat> which consumed much more than the people did, the distance you could go from a central supply point was not very large. And so what you had to do is you were advancing from supply point to supply point. The magic word is depot. And the enemy would be so inconvenient if you were advancing along here to build a fortress here. Here's the fortress. And you had to reduce the fortress to clear the road so you could continue to move forward. And so period warfare was in large part besieging fortresses to take them <coughs> to clear open your supply lines. If you wanted to supply over a fair distance, you more or less had to supply along rivers or along canals, or you had to pre-position supplies over a long... It got very messy and very expensive. And so if you said, we have area move, we have point-to-point -point movement, this looks much like um, period movement. There is an old GDW game, Soldier Kings. Um, there is a more modern game of the same title, so you want to be sure. I'm talking about the older one, in which you see this very clearly, and you had point location. Another possibility, someone asked about this a while back, is what is known as area maps. Suppose you look at a map of Massachusetts or Texas, and in Massachusetts it's a town map with each town a different color, and in um, Texas it's a county map since they have some hundreds of them, with each county a different color. You see, here's an area, and here's an area, and here's an area, and in most places, in many places, though not Great Plains states that were settled sort of at the same time, the counties look rather irregular. And you now have a map, and it's sort of like hexagons, but the map, the um, shapes of the areas are made to match the terrain features. So instead of deforming the mountains so they fit exactly inside a hexagon, you deform the area, so here is a mountain, and here is a lake, and you get funny shapes. Now, of course, the shapes can be really funny. Um, Massachusetts has at least one town whose parts are not contiguous all to each other. Um, it's in always interesting how history changes things. But the uh, core issue is that you could draw maps in which you keep the, air, the um, terrain features reasonably accurate in where they fit on the ground, and then you distort the grid into these pretty shaped areas, and the pretty shaped areas actually work as areas, and you can move into adjoining areas, and because you don't have to use squares, you don't have to distort things. Um, People have actually done this. Um, the very old game, Diplomacy, very classic title going back more than 50 years now, still heavily played. It's a light war game in the sense the warfare component, well, it's how you win. The warfare component is very, very simplified. It's mostly a talking game. Uh, in any event, you deform the terrain into areas. Of course, now that you've got the terrain into areas, you can do interesting things with them. For example, 
Here is the line dividing two provinces. And I can go in here, and here is a circle with a number three. And that is the movement point cost of going from one area to the next. And that reflects all of the nasty or pleasant terrain features of getting from A to B. And so you actually have something where you go from A to B, and you know for each edge how many movement points you're going to pay. Now, if you had a really huge map, um, putting all those numbers in would get tedious. Um, if you, unless the um, numbers are printed fairly large, the map would get hard to read. And so this is more something appropriate. Area maps have usually been used for maps that are not divided into too, too many squares. I mean, you can say, um, here is a game like um, Victory in the Pacific or War in the Pacific. Victory in the Pacific, the old Avalon Hill title, had some dozens, not very many dozens of areas. Uh, War in the Pacific, the more modern um, title, the current War in the Pacific, in addition to having 9,000 unit counters, has a huge map. Of, it's sort of 5 by 9 feet, sort of. I think that's right. And it's split into half-inch squares, or hexes, rather, all of which are numbered. Now, if you had to label each of those hex edges with the movement point cost, that would get extremely tedious artistically to do. And if the hex is this big, and the number has to be this big in order to be read, uh, suddenly the map looks a little funny. So there's some artistic and design choices here, but area maps are appropriate. Note, by the way, that area maps, where we've divided this into areas, and point maps with an irregular lattice of points, and maybe rows connecting them, or some of them, are exactly the same thing. They look different. The appearances are different. However, while the appearances are different, uh, if you ask what is the underlying structure on which the uh, rules will rest, they're the same. So far, so good? OK, well, that's enough on maps. We will come back to this some more after we've done a few more board war games. Uh, what I've done, I've talked about Stalingrad. I've talked about a couple of types of rules. And now we proceed to talk about um, some other types of rules that do not appear as much in other games. And I suppose we can talk about, hmm, what could we talk about? Morale, production, supply, logistics, intelligence, Yes, I'm by no means done yet. Um, we could also talk about something traditionally important, command and control. And command and control reflects the notion we will move towards the voice being first person or at least perhaps several first people. And when each first person tells the subordinate commanders what to do, the outcome may not be precisely what was desired. Um, black swans. Idiocy rules. The idiocy rules I'll talk about in a second. We'll start with black swans. The point of black swans is here we are, and we are, going, we are generals commanding a battle, or the admirals, and we do not necessarily know exactly what is going to happen because we do not necessarily know exactly how our weapons work. For example, if you look in the, oh, 
Napoleonic period forward to the present, if you have artillery, whether they're cannons or rocket weapons or whatever, there is the notion of counter-battery fire, in which you fire your artillery weapons at the other guy's artillery to knock it out. Now, the effectiveness of this depends on the period. Um, with modern radar and such not, uh, when the British were involved in the Yemen, and this goes back a couple of decades, uh, they had people who disapproved of them who would walk up, set up mortars, and start chucking mortar shells in the general direction of a British base. Uh, with modern artillery, uh, the outcome was the mortar shells would go up, they would be picked up on radar, the radar computer would inform the British of where the mortars were being fired from, and the British would start shooting back with artillery at the mortars, and they would be firing before the mortar, first mortar rounds landed. In fact, under favorable conditions, since mortars have a very high trajectory and artillery has a flat trajectory, the shoot back might arrive before the original rounds did. And the, for better or worse, the message to various people was, if you do not want counter-battery fire landing on your neighborhood, since we will not check what the target is before we start shooting at it, you might find it preferable to report the fact that someone is setting up a mortar position near your home. I'm not sure how that went over with anyone. Uh, but the notion is technology has changed. If you go back to the Civil War, though, there was one quite good Union general who was an artillerist who wrote rigorous orders that Union artillery units were forbidden to engage in counter-battery fire because the likelihood of being effective with it was basically non-existent, and it was a waste of ammunition. Well, some people didn't agree with him because other people insisted on engaging in it, and so you get these dis disputations. Now, what do we mean by black swan? Well, the black swan is something unexpected. So we will take a, a, an example. This is, if I recall correctly, the Battle of Zama, and Scipio Africanus, who was a, Latin, a Roman commander, who was faced with Carthage, Carthaginian army, and the Carthaginian army was loaded up with war elephants. And war elephants are large. These were African elephants, who are, which are not nearly as bright as Indian elephants, and tend to be quite aggressive when they become annoyed. And the Carthaginians were marching this up, these up, and the general notion was that since the Roman legion was guys with shield and an 18-inch sword, that they would have serious problems engaging the elephant without being trampled. However, Scipio Africanus, I believe this is who deserves credit for it, came up with a very clever idea, which would be embodied in the game as the flaming pig rule. He took a, several herds of swine. This was a very cruel thing to do to the pigs. He swaddled them very heavily in linen, soaked the linen in lamp oil, olive oil, and as the elephants approached, the pigs, were, which were still alive, were ignited, and <coughs> the Romans standing there poked the pigs with sharp, pointy things and screamed at them, and the pigs started running off, shrieking like swine in torment, which of course they were. And so here, here are the elephants coming one way, and here are these pigs in torment are very noisy, and they're on fire. And unfortunately, after a while, the pig itself starts to burn because it has a lot of body fat. And so the elephants looked at this and they did what you might expect. They decided to run away. Except they ran away through the, through the Carthaginian front lines and completely disordered the uh, Carthaginian army. So when the Romans marched up, the Carthaginians were in such a mess that they couldn't resist that effectively. That's flaming pig. Now, you could also advance forward towards the present and say, well, everyone had these neat ideas on their weapons, and everyone did not know how effective they would be. So, for example, if you look at World War II games, uh, there will be this certain, if you've got a tech tree, there will be this certain focus on atomic bombs. 
Now, period atomic bombs, that is, the atomic bombs that were actually used in warfare, um, were less effective than the equal dollar value of four engine bombers carrying explosives and incendiaries. They were colossally expensive, and um, you can in fact find the United States Strategic Bombing Survey, and they will give you a number as to how many B-29s, each flying one mission with their tonnage of this, that, and the other thing, you would need to duplicate the effects, at least the destructive effects, not the morale or political effects of the atomic bomb. And it's, you know, 500, meaning about half the number that were in use in the theater at the time. The advantage, of course, that the Japanese, we had, was the Japanese had no idea whether we had three of them or 300. And when I was at Michigan, there was this character who came through from Japan who was giving a talk based on the notion that the Americans had been planning on using thousands and thousands of them. Uh, the planning, American planning paper assumed that they would be quite cheap and they would be sort of like a blockbuster bomb, a 10-ton bomb, not what we actually got out. But you don't know in advance what is going to happen. At the time you start your atomic bomb project, you don't know whether it will create something that will blow up or not. And the reason we can be sure of this is, of course, the Germans had various projects, about 39 of them, none of which caught, produced anything that would go kerblamo. And so you don't know. Similarly, the Japanese had a device, a, a decent translation of the weapon is radar ray. And the radar ray was sort of like radar, but it was much, much more powerful. And so you fired at an American aircraft, and you incinerated the enemy aircraft with electromagnetic waves. Didn't work. But in advance, you don't know this. Um, ditto at Pearl Harbor. We knew our fleet was completely safe, because it, the properties of... Uh, naval torpedoes were well known. The airplane came in, it dropped a torpedo, it hit the water, and the first thing the torpedo did would be to go down about a hundred feet and then have to come back up to the surface because it was dropped from a height and it's heavy. And so it falls and comes back. Well, Pearl Harbor was only 50 feet deep and therefore the assumption was that any enemy torpedoes would hit the water, go to the bottom, and get stuck and therefore torpedo attacks inside Pearl Harbor were impossible. Unfortunately, the Japanese commander Genda came up with little breakaway wooden fins, and the function of the breakaway wooden fins was to ensure that when a Japanese torpedo hit the water, it would only go in a modest number of feet before it recovered and popped back to its correct depth and started chugging along, and therefore the Japanese could launch torpedo attacks inside Pearl Harbor we could not. <coughs> um, on the same line of torpedoes in World War II, um, we had a magnetic torpedo. And the magnetic torpedo may charitably be described as unreliable. The problem was, uh, in order to fire it and get a result, what it's supposed to do is sail under the enemy ship and when it is directly underneath, the magnetic field due to the enemy ship is changing rapidly, and the torpedo then detonates. Well, this is fine if you have a prolonged time to do a whole pile of calculations as to how exactly what the field is doing. Uh, this wasn't practical. Uh, the, the torpedo also had a contact detonator, which was too fragile. Instead of exploding when it hit the enemy ship, the detonator crumpled and there was no explosion. The net result was we had this neat weapon that wouldn't go off. And so there were things you do not anticipate. That is, you say, we know what's going to happen and we make our plans known on, based on weapons effects, but they were fake. I'd say the most spectacular fake, this only came out fairly recently, some of you, well, actually only a couple of us are old enough to remember the Cuban Missile Crisis and all the Polaris missile submarines going to sea. The absolute certain retaliation of a nuclear war started. What was kept extremely, extremely secret was that the fusing mechanism on the Polaris was defective 
and the Polaris might as well have been loaded with rocks for all of the damage it would do at the far end. They were dummy weapons that could not be made to work. It was a major problem to fix them. And you can look up the peculiar fact that when we were doing joint missile tests with the British in the 60s, there is this point where we actually fired a Polaris missile at a target and had the hydrogen bomb and the Polaris go off. And people were saying, well, this is just a stupid demonstration. What's the point of it? And the point was there was a serious question as to whether it was going to go kerblamo or not, which it did. <clears throat> so what I am saying here is that there is always some uncertainty as to what is going to happen. And um, the seri uncertainty leads to black swans that are very hard to include in the rules. That is, if you simply write the rules, the A-bomb goes off, the radar array does not hurt bombers, well, the decisions of the players are well known. The way you avoid this in the rules is you more or less have to say, uh, at some point, after you have paid for your atomic bomb project, you're going to discover whether it works or not, or whether it was large, expensive, and useless. Um, the idiocy rule refers to people whose behavior does not match the behavior that moderns would emulate. And on one hand, we can get such examples as the French at the start of World War I. The French had a military doctrine known as Elan, which was that the superior fighting spirit of the French soldier, armed with a bayonet, you know, a funny-shaped spear, <clears throat> would allow him to overcome German machine gun and artillery and infantry rifle fire, and he would charge home, and the Germans would be routed. That was the doctrine. It didn't work, and the French took massive losses as a result at the start of the war. That is one of the reasons why the Allies had so many problems in World War I. At the start of the war, the French army connived to have major losses. Uh, the Austro-Hungarian army had a matching problem, namely that Serbian spies had lifted all of their battle plans, and the Serbians knew exactly where to put units to block Aust Austro-Hungarian attacks. Uh, well, how do you fix this in the rules so that players will actually do these foolish things? And that is the domain of the idiocy rule. There are several alternative ways to proceed. If you are in a reasonably large board wargaming club, you look for the bottom board players who are idiots, who can be counted to find strategies that are heroic, spectacular, remarkable, and catastrophically unsuccessful. And that you can assign them to carry out these strategies. They'll do great, they'll do what they were asked, and you will duplicate idiocy. Another choice, however, is to say, well, none of these people were stupid. Some of them were misinformed. Some of them made estimates that turned out to be wrong. How do we encourage people to do this? And the answer is you have a rule. So let's go back to that World War I example. The French army attacks. And part of the time, when it pulls the hidden card, it discovers the Elam theory is correct. And on the first three turns, the French army is increased in strength fivefold on attack, or threefold, or how it's column shift. And you can imagine if you were fighting Stalingrad and on turn one the German army was tripled on attack, the game would be played very differently because on turn one the German army would wipe out any Russian unit it could get next to. The Russians would beat this by leaving the smallest possible number of delaying units along their front so that the attacks would kill as few Russians as possible. <clears throat> however, however, um, the um, Germans, um, if you tell the Germans it's always this way, they'll do know what to do. But if you don't know in advance and you have to lay out all your attacks, and then you discover whether your army is good at or not, now you're sort of giving, it's not actually idiocy, it's a mistaken impression of reality which has caught up with you. Um, as we are approaching the end of time, 
We will, in future lectures, discuss these. Maybe I'll say a few words about morale. Uh, the main notion in morale is that here we are, and we have an army, and it has been winning, 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 and the other side has been losing every battle, and at some point the people on the other side notice that if they go into battle, they get killed. You may imagine, those of you who have seen George Pal's War of the Worlds movie, uh, the condition of the combat armies after it's gotten around that you fight Martians and you die and you don't damage them, there will be this great reluctance of the army or navy or air force to go into battle because it's an entirely suicidal act. Um, but if you want to, you can find people who don't have this issue. At the end of World War II, the Germans had this cute anti-tank rocket, the Panzerfaust. It had one problem. It had a range of 25 or later 50 yards. You had to be right on top of the enemy tank to use it. And in addition to the enemy tank wanting to shoot at you, the enemy tanks tended to be accompanied by this substantial group of enemy soldiers who would want to kill anyone who wanted to hurt their friend, the T-34-85. So how do you beat this? The German fascists found a simple solution, namely they realized that young teenage boys are firmly convinced that they are invincible in battle and indestructible. And so they handed the Panzerfaust in large numbers over to 12 and 14 year olds. They also were given to combat soldiers on the grounds, well maybe you're going to be stuck and you would rather have this than not. And the um, teenagers would hide in foxholes, and when the Russian tank got close, they would pop up and shoot at the Russian tank from point-blank range. This was, of course, a suicidal act, but it got a Russian tank. Um, that's, mora that's high morale. Uh, low morale is armies that run away at the, sight of, at the rumor that the enemy is approaching. Um, and you can incorporate this into rules. If you're within a battle, you can also incorporate it as, well, we have a morale value for each army, and when morale goes downhill, you start getting column shifts on your die roll table. So if your morale goes down, you thought you were attacking at 3 to 1, you're now only rolling on the 2 to 1 column. Or if you've been doing well, you thought you were attacking at 3 to 1, you're now attacking on the 4 to 1 column. Uh, if you have different sorts of units, elite units, uh, worthless militia units, whatever, um, you can have, give them die roll shifts, and part of that is skill, and part of that is confidence in their own ability to kill the enemy rather than dying gloriously. That's morale rules. We will continue this next time. Until then, we are done.